Sagar, thank you so much. Uh, impeccable timing, and I can that can happen when you control the end-to-end -end value chain. So uh, we uh, really appreciate your being here. Uh, uh, so very quickly, uh, you know, uh, you know, can we get some perspective in terms of you know big focus on infrastructure, uh, energy transition? And I'm making this a context that when you look at the last 10 years, you had a lot of these large conglomerates move into what you call traditionally the consumer-facing business. And to the best of my knowledge, there's only one group which took an opposite bet, which is completely new infrastructure. What is the big picture? First of all, I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, yes, underestimated traffic here, and my flight got delayed as well. So sorry for that, everyone. Would have been here much earlier. Um, so to your question, see, the way, and you're right, that uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, as a group, we took a contra view to what was, what was being thought about in the market overall, right? Because always a lot of narratives at that point in time were based on the consecutive failures of a lot of infrastructure companies one after the other. When we looked at the whole thing very closely, we were very clear about one thing fundamentally, that if India has to prosper, India has to succeed economically, socially, and otherwise, it is inevitable that infrastructure of a magnitude would have to be created which would present a once-in-a-generation opportunity for people who are willing and able to do it well. There's a lot of reasons why many other infrastructure companies could not succeed. Uh, we've tried our best to learn from them. And uh, I think we've been able to do a pretty uh, okay job in terms of, because fundamentally when we looked at all of this, we thought about setting up infra in the way infra is done in the US, in Australia, in developed countries, who have historically done infra very, very well. Uh, and you know, I'm sure Robbie must have talked through some of those things, and we'll talk about more uh, in detail questions. But the way we look at the sector overall is um, in infra, in energy transition, today where we stand, we genuinely do have a once in a generation opportunity. If you look at our platform, what we've been able to deliver, we've been able to deliver tech levels of growth in real assets and fundamental assets which have 30, 40 year concession and time periods and very, very stable revenues and very, very stable uh, EBITDAs, pretty much delinked from a market perspective. No matter what happens, you know, our assets will continue to generate their cash, continue to perform, continue to deliver. Most of them are contracted on a long-term basis. So an opportunity of this size, this kind, you don't find at very many other places in the world. So uh, we're embedded in it, we're entrenched in it, and with the last 30 years of experience that we have in infrastructure, We've now made an ecosystem of uh, uh, entities and platforms across all spectrums of infra infrastructure that gives us a very unique opportunity to build on that even further. So we'll continue to keep doing that. Uh, thank you. Uh, Robbie, excellent presentation. Uh, the numbers that you talked about and you put in the context of where we stand vis-a-vis -vis the country, vis-a-vis -vis the Nifty, as well as the global context, that's, uh, that's an eye-opener. Uh, uh, just taking from where uh, you know Sagar talk about the opportunities in green energy and energy transition, uh, how is Adani Group capitalizing on that? Uh, how are you, uh, you know, what, what's our big strategy there? I think when when we look at uh, say you know question comes to so how do you uh, what made you decide to go into say Adani Green? How how you saw, how did we set up Adani Green or what? what was the logic behind building Adani Energy Solution, which is transmission and distribution businesses. See, the way we see this is that uh, the, historically speaking, when you look at uh, energy sector, the energy sector we've worldwide is a composite sector but disaggregate pricing. So for example, uh, LNG is available in the US at, or frac gas is at about two to three dollars MMBTU. Uh, before the uh, European war in Europe it's available at five to six rupees MMBTU and in India at the best of times we import at between 12 to 15 dollars MMBTU so what that means is that our industry is paying three times the European price for energy and about seven times the price of energy for compared to US so that's the competition element that our in industry faces so when when we when the energy transition space ev evolved what we realized was that if we are able to conceptualize this at scale, 
we could disrupt this energy ecosystem. We could actually produce domestic energy delinked from US dollar prices at a price that is competitive to global energy. So offer energy to the Indian industry that would be at least comparable to the, to the European energy. So, so the way we look at it is that, so we've set up our businesses in the same way, is that we don't look at sort of like PPAs or uh, transmission agreements, that, that's good to have those contracts. But the way we look at it is that we have to be the lowest cost producer of energy. So if you can produce, say, argument's sake, if Qatar produces uh, uh, LNG at, you know, one dollar uh, MMBTU, everybody buys from them. So our objective was to have produce green electron, cheapest green electron, extract energy from the sun in the cheapest possible way. And then whatever that took, and then the chairman went through the steps that, that we have to take to achieve that, to, then we required that, okay, we need to have uh, the module and wind turbine manufacturing ecosystem that would allow us to price the product in, in Indian rupees. So, so because if you, if you simply assemble modules, then somebody can ch ch raise the price of ingot wafer and then your price goes up. You build ingot wafer, somebody can raise the price of foundry and your silica go price goes up and then again your price goes up. So we had to build this entire ecosystem and bring it into the domestic market. That's what we've done. And I think that's how we look at energy. So that meant that we also had to look at the duration as well. So, the, so that's how we, we say, okay, well, where do we raise our capital? How do we raise our capital? Be it debt or equity. And then you have to match that to the 20, 30 year period. So, 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 so people who want to invest or investors who want to invest for 20 years or 30 years is what we look for. And, and that defines a lot of things in terms of where we go. Uh, we, we, we believe that uh, uh, culturally India is very suited to long term capital. Our, our communities, our society, our people, our families, uh, parents invest for their children, which gives you the ultimate long-term capital. So I think so that all of that matches perfectly, provided we can execute on the ground, which as Sagar mentioned, you can build and you can operate assets properly. So the main focus, as in my presentation also, the main focus is that you have to build properly and create assets prop in, a, in a manner that is consistent with long-term value. Yeah, so, uh, so first question is for Sagar. Uh, in terms of uh, your growth strategy, I guess uh, the company has a philosophy of growth with goodness. Uh, so how are you able to like implement this and uh, how are you able to achieve such, uh, such fast-paced growth uh, across businesses and at the same time maintain the profitability? See, as a, as a major... I think one unique thing about our platforms is every single one of our listed companies, right? They enjoy the benefit of having a majority shareholder who drives, who's able to set up the vision, who's able to drive the company forward. From an overall perspective, we fundamentally in the last 30 years that we've developed companies, we've never sold. So we are fundamentally very, very long uh, in terms of equity. What that enables us to do is have a very, very sustained long-term view in terms of sectors, assets that we participate in and how we go about and participate. What do I mean by that? You would have, you will never see a single one of any of our entities who will participate in projects just because we want to build a book and sell it in two years to the next best buyer. So fundamental investment decisions that we take, any one of our platforms, any one of our entities take are long equity in nature. They have to meet and maintain a minimum threshold in terms of profitability, significantly above our weighted average cost of capital. They have to make sure that sectors that they are in are sustainable over the longer run, and that the entities are set up in the right manner, from an execution perspective, from an operations perspective, from a management perspective, and from a capital perspective. So that they're able to run over 20, 30, 40 year periods comfortably and properly. There is nothing that we have that is set up for a two-year period or a four-year period or a five-year period. I think that is a fundamental differentiator that we have compared to most, many and most other companies in the sector because a lot of, so to speak, private equity plat back platforms miss this thing many times. You know, they sometimes participate in very aggressive projects that they should not be. So they, they take decisions which are not suited to the long-term uh, long development and long-term opportunity. Uh, from a sector perspective, from a company perspective. So we don't do that at all. And we have the privilege of not doing that because there is nothing that we have to answer in a quarter or a six months or a one year. 
because we have a 20 year, 30 year investment horizon ourselves. So that's one fundamental differentiating factor to answer your question about profitability and sustainability. See, in terms of growth, I think that is one thing that we differentiate ourselves fundamentally compared to every other company uh, in the sector. The one thing that we are really, really, really good at is execution. Um, um, from a family standpoint, uh, our management, every single person, the one thing that every single person is most focused on is executing. Because we are, we believe fundamentally we are only as good as what we execute on the ground. Excel sheets, business plans, this, that is all very, very good, sounds good, looks good, but nothing means anything as long as you're able to execute projects on the ground. So we've set up now over a period of uh, more than two decades, 470 odd projects across the length and breadth of the country in every single state in the country, uh, large infrastructure projects with long gestation periods. And we've been able to do every single one of them successfully. Uh, there have been small periods where uh, a certain group of assets have been stressed, they've, 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 they've been through trouble, and we've been able to successfully come out of that as well, uh, in a thermal business, for example, right? So a lot of those things, we, we have a fundamental view in terms of long infra, but at the same time with a very, very core focus and a very strong bias towards execution. So we execute projects uh, very, very, very closely and very well, and we have a company that, 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 that does that, Adani Infra uh, Limited. So that is a company that has more than 4,000 people who sold solely day in, day out focuses just on that. We have an order book uh, ourselves internally that is larger than pretty much l &T now. So that's the scale of execution that we do internally. But also once the projects are set up, we have a very rigorous focus in terms of o and as well. So if you look at any one of our companies in any sector, their operating parameters and their operating metrics are best in class across amongst all of their peers. And we do capital in a fundamentally different way. So we have 30 year, 40 year assets, but none of them are funded by short term paper. So uh, I'm sure Robbie would have mentioned in his presentation, but we always match the capital to the asset that is underlying. So we don't carry uh, ALM, especially again from a long term sustainability point of view. And that all adds into our sustainability, our profitability, and our ability to deliver and execute even faster year on year. So we just think about it in that sense overall. Right, I think uh, uh, quite insightful. And uh, just to like uh, follow up on that, and this is for Robbie. So, so in terms of your capital management uh, right now, so if we think that we are here for like uh, 20, 30 years, uh, so uh, how do you plan it? I mean, so long into the future, and also the fact that in terms of returns to shareholders, uh, what are your thoughts on that? See, the, uh, we, we have, broadly speaking, when we look at this, the primary objective remains that the, the, um, we have an underlying asset structure of a particular business, be it ports or airports, roads, uh, transmission distribution, etc. So, so we don't have a, a, a generic model that we use. We, we set it up for each of the underlying assets and we, we plan in that manner. Overall, though, we have core uh, three core uh, areas from capital perspective and there one is that uh, we we do not leverage our assets very high so for example we have an asset base of just over 60 billion us dollars today on which we earn return and our total debt gross debt uh, net debt at the group level uh, portfolio level is roughly about uh, 18 uh, billion. So, so at an asset level, we have 40 billion of equity, 20 billion of debt. So we, we don't gear, we, we are very, very conservative at asset level. We only ever leverage our cash flow. So we, we do not say that we, we, we have an asset, it might earn cash or not earn cash and you leverage it. We have no such basic principle. We simply borrow purely on the basis of how much the rate of return that asset can earn. And we are very, very strict with this. We do not have a single balance sheet covenant that we ever give either banks or investors. We say because it's not about how much you can build the asset for, it's how much an asset can earn a return. And, and we, so, so that's why I, uh, so that, that's the second element of, from a capital point of view. And the third element on the capital point of view is that we do not like to carry individual businesses as well. We do not want to carry any 
or two, two fundamental risks. One, we do not want to carry any refinance risks. Okay. That if we want to refinance something, our fund basic objective is, and instruction to all, from a risk point of view, to all public companies is, that whatever you want to refinance in the next, as I mentioned, in 12 months, one day, you must have in cash. Okay, so you don't, no, com no company in our, in our portfolio carries a refinance risk. We can just pay whatever is coming due. And we call it the liquidity ratio. It is normally, it is across the board set at 1.25 times whatever is coming due in the next 12 months and one day. The third element of this is that we do not also want to carry systemic risk. And the systemic risk is that for any reason whatsoever, we call it event risk management internally, any event that happens in the world, war, pandemic, or any economic disruption event, we, uh, we and, and, and for, some, for any reason, banking sector is shut. Then we should not be in a position then to say that, oh, now I, we can't refinance or we can't. So we want to, we set up, and that you saw, saw in the graph, if we want to make sure that the profile of our capital is such, that whatever our assets, infra assets can earn, we can just take that and pay. And keep honoring that payment, not for one year or two years or three years, ad infinitum. So that determines fundamentally how we look at the capital planning. And so now, naturally what it does for us is that we run, we present 10 years, because that's public, uh, but internally we go all the way to 2051. Uh, that determines how we look at what we can spend today. Uh, one of the mistakes that, uh, and Sagar alluded to it in his uh, uh, point, one of the mistakes that uh, happens uh, globally is that the investment horizon is not adequate to the underlying business that you're investing in. And for us, uh, uh, the way we look at it is that if you look at uh, Indian airports today, so we, you know, we have an airports business, so the following is happening in the Indian market. Uh, the Indian airlines have ordered 700 new planes. And so the planes in India will go from current level to about 3x, about 3,000 planes will be there. Now, that means that uh, we are adding roughly about, give or take, about 30 million new passengers, people who have not flown previous year, but will fly this year to our flying passengers. So, so at our airports, what will happen is that we will have roughly about 240 million passengers. And for every passenger, there are four other people who will come to the airport. Okay. So we will have roughly 1 billion. So we'll have 1.2 billion unique visits to the airport terminal. So if we now today building an airport and we don't plan for this, what will happen is that very before we build it, we'll have a problem. So when you're now looking at this, we are trying to explain that to the financial community, which is our equity debt investors, and say this is what we are doing, so that they understand and do not expect us to do something within the one year or two year period. So that, that is where, because we ourselves are long-term investors, and we own between 55 to 65, or sorry, between 65 to 70 percent of our companies, we say we will be there. So the investors are comfortable, the banks are comfortable, the, the debt capital markets are comfortable, rating agencies are comfortable. So that allows us to plan, and that is one of the things that we want to make sure that we, we, we plan of that, on that horizon. Now there you can be wrong, there's a forecasting error, this, that, so we have very robust models to look at it, how, what, what errors can come in, and, 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 the, and we learn and we continually, um, uh, we call it risk response model, so whenever we learn something we put, put that back in and refresh the models. Uh, but the basic idea is that it develops on the execution. So, so, so uh, whether we build the city side development, whether we build car parks at the airport, whether we build hot hotels at the airport, it is designed on the manner that it, it is responsive to that area. So in, you will see that we don't have any blanket view. In Jaipur, you will go to our airport, it look like Jaipur airport. And you go to, go to Lucknow, it will look like, and the reason is that it's serving that community. And so, 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 so a lot of inputs go into this, but the base, base input remains that you, you solve for managing systemic risk and managing refinance risk from a capital point of view. 
and 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 uh, and uh, and that that's what drives the the capital manning capital management planning process thank you so sakal let me come back to you uh, because uh, you know the portfolio of businesses uh, that the group runs and i remember in one of the conversation that we had with robi you talked about how the synergies between the group companies and uh, you know you made a statement that ideally you want uh, the cement price is to compete with brick prices six is out seven is out because that is a kind of cost that you can take away how do you uh, you know move these synergies across the various portfolio companies that you've got so we have a very diversified set of um, um, companies in our portfolio but what's important is that it's all if you really think about it it's all very concentrated in two main verticals transport logistics and energy and utilities so whether it's ports airports roads rail water that's all a part of the transport vertical and renewable energy thermal transmission distribution smart meters data centers that's all a part of the energy vertical the large business we talking about so wherever large infra has to be built anywhere in the country there's a lot of things that need to happen simultaneously i'll give you a small example of khawda which is where we building the world's largest single location renewable energy park so in khawda we have five group companies who've put full efforts of theirs that is enabling adani green to set up khawda in the way that it is being set up and in the time that it is being set up um we have adani green who's setting up of course the actual uh, uh project and the entire planning overall in terms of the master planning we have adani infra who's doing the epc and the construction we have adani energy solutions who's setting up the transmission lines and evacuation we have ambuja acc who's set, setting up the uh, cement plants so supplying uh, uh, rmc and cement to all the areas in the in the particular location we have adani ports who's helping with regards to all the imports exports that are happening from that location and we have adani logistics who's helping with all the trucking container movements this that and the other with regards to making sure goods reach the site in time within cost and uh, uh, in the overall plan that we have so if you think about it there's six adani group companies who've put all their efforts who's bringing all of their strengths to have the project become a reality in sync overall similar i can give another example 2 years ago we bought uh, uh, ambuja acc uh, from from hulsim right at that time we were not present in the cement sector at all uh, when we looked at the business we saw the business to be 70% of the business to be logistics and energy so with the strength of the core platform that we have which is transport logistics and energy and utilities it enables to also we just set up a copper plant as well right now we're setting up a pvc plant we uh, already have the cement business our core platform has a very unique ability of being able to sort of come together and provide very specific strengths that solves an ecosystem for what needs to be built so for cement for example you know we, we were able to pretty much double the beta on the existing capacity and we'll double the capacity as well just because of the level of synergies that were able to bring in into our cement business because of our core vertical in transport logistics energies and utilities so every one of them is a separate listed company which has its own management which works in a completely independent manner but there is a core platform advantage for large at scale projects that need to be done which can take advantage of all of this so it it it's very very helpful across the board you know for anything that needs to be done i think that the uh, one uh, example we can give where it becomes important is that the um, you know how you run these large infra assets so not very many um, know we we run india's largest industrial cloud business which is dani infra management services limited um and uh, and it's it's a technology heavy platform um its partnership with the the backbone is provided by google it is our ip uh, so it's a google partnership but it also has partnership with intel and qualcomm because uh, we we will buy uh, we will deploy the largest amount of what is called the edge data centers in our own businesses so which is that having a smart data center at the very edge of where the module is where the wind turbine is where the power plant is where the transmission system is where the substation is and 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 this be very specialized in that sense so uh, like when it's not just acc ambuja say for example as agar get the building the cement plant it's a very specialized concrete required because a very special area is certain salinity level certain salt certain winds certain way the sand hits the pillars 
So, so it has to produce a special type of cement to use in that area. Similarly, Adani um, uh, Energy Solutions business, the substation cannot be air-cooled substation. It is, uh, it is air insulated, gas insulated substation. So which means that, you know, when we, when we are going to build there, uh, entire capacity of the gas insulated substations were we, we buy in the entire country. Because, uh, so, so that ecosystem is required. You know, when you do the piling infrastructure, which is referred to Adani Infra, uh, which is also almost the same size as LNT, by the way, uh, Adani Infra India Limited, which is the, the now to pile in a, in a clay is one thing, to, pile on, to make piling in the rock is one thing, but make piling in a sand requires, a technology required meant that we have to build a brand new piling model for India. And then, we had to work with IIT Rurki to set it up where it can be tested. But then, nowhere in the country the testing was available. So we had to then, entire simulation model went to Cambridge. And then Cambridge tested it. So that's when we could confirm that this, yes, these piling and these things will last. And so, so a lot of that ecosystem is available to us so we can execute on that basis. And from an output perspective, uh, there's three other companies who work in the same zone in Kavla, right? So we've, we've been, We've now evacuated about 3,000 megawatts from Kauda, and everyone else who started together with us has not even been able to evacuate a single megawatt till date. So that's the level of speed, scale, benefit that we get from a synergistic perspective because all entities are working simultaneously. Of course, I think, uh, you know, Sabri had been to a Kauda and we've heard and he's come back very bullish and, you know, when, when you see it is when you uh, believe things. Uh, uh, Sagar, very quickly again, because you directly oversee uh, the green hydrogen stuff, uh, and it's very, very important part in terms of how we want to uh, get this carbon neutral stage. Uh, what are groups' uh, plans and strategy over there? No, I think um, uh, I'm not sure how much time we have, but in the interest of time, I'll try and keep it very high level and short so that sure. we can cover the important parts. See, the way we look at hydrogen, clean green hydrogen, is very simple. Right now, we're the largest player in the so-called electricity sector, right? So there's, there's, there's an electron play. With green hydrogen, you have an opportunity to enter into the ener entire energy ecosystem, not only electricity, but industrial use, transport use, fertilizer, uh, and electricity. So you have a potential of entering the entire energy value chain end to end. So that's the scope of the sector that becomes available to you when you participate in this particular uh, opportunity. Second, from an overall perspective, India, it, this is, it is very, very important that India goes ahead with setting up green hydrogen and green hydrogen derivatives at a very large scale. Why? Today, from a fertilizer and transport perspective, India is totally dependent on imports. And that's the second highest contributor in terms of India's uh, uh, CAD, current account deficit. As we stand today, we have the opportunity and the possibility to set up green hydrogen and derivatives within 10-year average import cost of India. Cheaper, if we set up large-scale green hydrogen derivatives today, we can land the price today with sufficient returns within the 10-year average cost of the government of India. And subsidies would be entirely eliminated. So from an India perspective, it's a huge thing. From a government perspective, it eliminates the current account deficit. Second, no forex outflow because the entire value chain of uh, green hydrogen is end-to-end -end domesticated. Everything is within India. From the manufacturing to setting up the renewable plants to setting up the downstream plants and to end consumers, everything is within the country. So there is no dollar outflow, there is no forex outflow. And third and most important, when we look at the whole sector, for someone to be successful at setting up green hydrogen and derivatives at a large scale, there are a couple of things that you require. You require huge resource, so you require large tracts of unencumbered land where you can set up large solar, wind, uh, and all other such power plants. You also require a very robust back-end supply chain because when you want to invest to the extent of 20, 30, 40 billion dollars, you cannot depend on modules coming from China, you cannot depend on wind turbines coming because any disruptions, because the end contract pricing is fixed. So unlike um, the current energy where, you know, if LNG import prices increase, your end diesel, diesel prices increase as well. Crude prices increase, diesel prices increase as well. This is not like that. So your end, from a contract perspective, your revenue, your EBITDA is fixed. 
So what you need to ensure, similar to what you have in renewables, is that your cost is fixed as well. So you can't afford to have supply chain uncertainties. So you need to set up a very robust supply chain, which we now have. We have end-to-end -end manufacturing of solar, the entire solar manufacturing ecosystem. We manufacture wind turbines ourselves as well. Uh, we have a resource tie-up of a very, uh, uh, very significant amount, about 40-odd gigawatts, is something that we have readily available with us within the green hydrogen platform. Because if you don't set it up at scale, you will not be able to land the cost. So there's very, it, 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 it's not as simple as setting up a renewable plant. It's a little more complex, which plays to our advantage as well, because we have an opportunity and we have a strength in setting up the end-to-end -end ecosystem with very few players in the country would be able to. So that's how we look at green hydrogen overall. Uh, we think that there is going to be uh, definite policy uh, incentives and policy push from the government of India, looking at the criticality of this from an India perspective. So the government will also definitely be coming ahead, uh, coming forward with bringing in the right policy architecture for investors like ourselves and many others to participate in the sector overall. And we'll, uh, right now we're setting up ourselves in a way that whenever that comes from the government, we are fully ready. And we're able to respond and we're able to set it up in a uh, sort of a size and scale that no one else in the country would be able to. So we're fully set up for that. The only one thing that we're working out the final details of is the electrolyzer. So we finalized the technology already, but we're working out the final partnership and licensing agreements with the various manufacturers across the world. Other than that, every single thing from our perspective is squared off. We have the land, we have the entire engineering done, we know the cost at which we'll generate the green electron, which will be the cheapest in the country. Uh, Electrolyzer, we will have locked up in the next five to six months maximum. Um, we have the entire downstream, everything set up already. Uh, we've set up a zone separately in Mundra where the entire industrial complex will come for generating ammonia, urea. Uh, good part in the strength we have is we have a lot of carbon dioxide in Mundra because of the thermal plant that we have. So all that carbon dioxide can be sequestered and used to convert ammonia into urea, uh, which there would be no other place in the country which would uh, have this opportunity and the, the, the location that would make this available. So we're fully set up for the platform. The only one thing we need to do is electrolyzers, which we'll have locked up in the next five to six months. After that, we will be in a position to be able to deliver 2 million tons of uh, green hydrogen. That's about 40 gigawatts equivalent of uh, green hydrogen and downstream derivatives from that. Uh, thank you. So, uh, you know, really short on time, so maybe just one or two questions from the audience. Uh, hard stop is next for five minutes. Hi. You guys have done a tremendous job uh, in whatever you've done, all the infrastructure, power, everything else. Does it, is that... Is getting into the automotive field the logical extension of what you guys are doing? You're generating power and the whole EV chain. Automotive is no plan yet. It doesn't excite you all. As we see the costing, you know, the cost of renewable power has to be significantly lower for the green hydrogen to better hydrate versus to grey hydrogen. So, do you think those catalysts, the government, because they're very large investments from three groups, and we are pretty large, so it actually has to be accelerated, but it's still taking time. So, do you think that that gap will be filled well? The only thing we're looking at from the government is offtake. So, uh, whenever we make any of our business plans, we don't make them at all on the basis of any um, government subsidy whatsoever. If we think that a sector fundamentally needs government subsidy to be sustainable, we don't participate. So we're very, very clear about that. The reason we're so bullish about green hydrogen is today, with zero government subsidy, we are able to land green hydrogen within 10-year import cost of India. So that's why we are so bullish in terms of why we want to do it. The only thing we need from government is, like in renewables, they give PPAs, uh, which is assured offtake. We just want to make sure that there is assured offtake after which we start our investments. So we are setting up our platform in a way that, uh, see, if you think about it in a different way, what green hydrogen is, is basically a Vari, Vikram, Suzlon, plus Adani Green, yes. plus downstream combined put together in one platform. Yes. So that's just a simplistic way of looking at green hydrogen in terms of the value potential. Um, the only thing that needs, that developers like ourselves need to make it click is to make sure that there is offtake, again, just to get the sector going from the beginning. Because independently, even still, our philosophy is that we will land the cost at such a level that offtake or no offtake, we will be the cheapest. 
So there'll be no option but for entities to buy from us because we'll just be fundamentally the cheapest. But to se get the sector going from a comfort to lenders perspective from a lot of different reasons, we just want to make sure that there is offtake in the beginning to just kick the sector off. Once that is there, we'll be in a good place to be able to execute overall. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Saluk, sir. Saluk, Saluk, camera. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank